Uh, the topic of my presentation this morning is calcific tendonitis of the shoulder. But perhaps a more uh, appropriate type would be, the, would be calcific tendonitis of supraspinatus tendon, given that that's the, uh, the, the, site, the most common site of this uh, disease. Um, I'll go over uh, some background, some pathology, uh, the clinical features, management options, and also um, refer briefly to these in a conclusion. By way of background, um, uh, calcific tendonitis of the shoulder is uh, the deposition of, of calcium pyrophosphate within the, the tendon and muscle belly of the rotator cuff. The most common site is in the supraspinatus tendon in the uh, critical zone, uh, one to one and a half centimetres away from its uh, proximal, ins its distal insertion. Um, it, it tends to affect people of uh, the white racial background, so Caucasians, and it affects a very specific age group, those between the age of 30 and 50, with a, a female preponderance. At any given time, um, it'll affect 10% of the population, and in of those affected individuals, 10% again will be bilateral. Um, for the majority of uh, people with uh, the finding of um, calcific tendonitis, uh, calcium deposition on x-ray, the majority will be asymptomatic. The pathogenesis of this disease, although it's been described so well for the last 80 years, is still controversial. And there are two broad schools of thought. Uh, the first is a degenerative school of thought, and the second is a, uh, a reactive process. So the degenerative process um, was described initially by Codman, who suggested that with ageing we get degeneration of the, the tendons of the rotator cuff, which leads to necrosis of the tendon, which then acts as a nidus for uh, dystrophic, dystrophic calcification. Um, and that's been supported by a number of articles in the literature, the first being by Brewer, who demonstrated there's diminished vascularity, thinning of the fascicles and vascular supply to those areas affected by uh, calcific tendonitis on histological studies. <coughs> Another study by McLaughlin which showed that there's fibrillation of the outer fibres and subsequent wear and necrosis, which could also act as a nidus for calcification. And also studies by Moore and Bilger, which showed uh, necrosis of the tenocytes in areas affected by uh, dystrophic calcification. Like I said, it is still controversial and uh, the, the main arguments against the degenerative um, uh, putative hypothesis is that um, there is resolution of the, this process um, in calcific tendonitis, whereas with degeneration of the rotator cuff, that seems to be a progressive and you know, in one direction towards without uh, recovery or without resumption of res resolution of symptoms. Um, the age spectrum that is affecting people who are in the age group of 30 to 50 is also against the degenerative hypothesis. And the, it also makes the point that there needs to be delineation between degenerative calcification, which occurs in the setting of uh, the wear and tear and tendons, and this uh, self-resolving process. And so, from my reading, it suggested that the more uh, accepted theory is a, a reactive phenomenon, which is an active cell-mediated process. Um, so, most of the work of this has been done by a um, by a Professor Uttman who uh, describes three different stages, the pre-calcific, calcific and post-calcific, which I'll describe now. Uh, the first stage, um, after, potentially after an um, ischemic uh, uh, impetus, is changes from, of the tenocytes to chondrocytes and fibrocardial uh, metaplasia. Uh, this can be painful. Uh, the next stage is a formative phase where there's deposition of calcium into vacuoles. These then coalesce to form uh, chalky deposits of calcification within the tendon. Um, this, the, the, the tendon then enters a resting period, which is quite painful for the patient, um, before a resorption where there's active infiltration around the lesion with new vessels uh, before re um, reabsorption of the, the, the calcium deposition which is probably the most painful phase for the patient. Um, after resorption, the area is then infiltrated with new collagen and new tissue. Uh, this table just summarises those pathological stages and the evolution of pain throughout that process. 
The clinical approach to uh, calcific tendonitis is relatively straightforward. Patients present uh, within that age group usually um, with a, a history of an acute onset uh, shoulder pain which is severe and the majority of them resolve within a few days. Uh, when you see the patient often they are holding their arm in ad adduction and resting the arm and, and being very unwilling to move it and there's a, a global decrease in the range of motion on examina examination secondary to pain. Uh, initial testing using inflammatory markers are often raised, particularly ESR, and that second one is, third one is supposed to read CRP. And the, the characteristic findings are on X-ray, which is on of a, uh, a calcific focus, which can be localised to the tendon, uh, the typical site, like I said before, one to one and a half centimetres away from the insertion. Most often it's in um, the supraspinatus tendon, although it can occur in the other tendons of the rotator cuff and thus um, shoulder x-rays with internal and external rotation views will give you better views of the, the, the respective um, other tendons of the rotator cuff. There are two types of, um, of findings on x-ray. This one is a type two, which is, uh, sorry, that's type one, which is a very homogeneous, well delineated lesion. And this is the, this is the lesion which tends to be um, characterized by less pain as, compo as compared to the type 2. This is an x-ray of the type 2. Um, yeah, by way of difference, this one is more uh, fluffy and cloud-like and it indicates a resorptive phase, which is the painful phase for the patient. Management options for calcific tendonitis. The, the vast majority of patients will get away with non-operative management and it will be a, a self-resolving uh, condition for them. And so treatment uh, is directed towards supporting them. The mainstay of treatment is um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, which act on the uh, arachidonic acid pathway to decrease the inflammatory response and provide symptomatic relief. Um, physiotherapy often plays a role with uh, maintaining the range of motion of the glenohumeral joint during this time. Um, there, are, there is a suggestion there may be a role of corticosteroids, or that's, although that's not currently reflected in the evidence. Some centres advocate that the corticosteroids may have an, a positive effect when there's evidence of impingement of the rotator cuff as well. Um, physiotherapy directed ultrasound treatment of the lesions um, has proven to, has been shown to have a benefit compared to sham or placebo treatment. Um, although the, there isn't compelling evidence that it makes a, a difference in, for the patient's uh, pain that they experience. A well, very well described technique is needling and aspiration and this can be performed either clinically or also under fluoroscopic control. The, uh, there are two main techniques which I saw described. Uh, the first was simply repeated needling of the tendon around the lesion to, to decrease pressure and provide symptomatic relief. And the other one is an irrigation method where you have two syringe, uh, syringes, one with the, the lavage and one to drain the lavage from around the area. And essentially in a push-pull method, the, the, the calcium deposition is dissolved using the lavage, um, lavage method. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy has also been well described. Uh, we see this more, we're more familiar with this with uh, lithotripsy for renal calculi, but it's also been successfully used in bone and joint problems, including plantar fasciitis. Um, with calcific tendonitis of the rotator cuff, uh, the, the, depending on which sort of um, extracorporeal shockwave methodology you use, uh, a shock wave is generated by electromagnetic or crystal impulse, which uh, essentially breaks up the calcified deposit on the tendon. Um, there's good evidence for this, which was summarised nicely in a recent JOS um, article. Uh, it's a very busy slide, but the thing to take away from it is that um, use of extracorporeal shock wave therapy is better than placebo. Um, the response to it seems to be dose related. So higher frequency and intensity and more uh, exposure to shockwave therapy um, seems to result in a better patient resolution of symptoms. And the final management option for this condition uh, includes operative measures. Uh, as I said before, the vast majority of patients will get away with non-operative management. Um, for those that have recalcitrant, recalcitrant 
symptoms that aren't responding to non-operative measures, um, failure to progress or, or worsening symptoms and uh, significant interference with ADLs may benefit from operative procedure. Um, and some of the benefits that have been espoused from the various uh, describers of the techniques are that there are shorter rehabilitation times um, and when comparing open versus arthroscopic, arthroscopic has been said to have better functional results compared to open and better cosmesis. I'll describe the arthroscopic debridement. Um, using your standard portals, the, the glenohumeral joint is explore, explored and often the vascular injection pattern can be seen over the superior part of the capsule which uh, uh, corresponds to the supraspinatus tendon. And that's described, that's um, what this image here is showing. Uh, the subacromial space is entered and after examination of the area, the rotator cuff, the, the calcific focus is identified either by direct palpation or by visualisation, and a longitudinal incision is made. And using probes and um, manipulation of the deposit, the, the, the calcific deposition is removed. Um, depending on what stage of the, of the, the pathogenesis the, the lesion is at, it may either come out as a, a milky toothpaste-like material or as a, a, a dry, chalky paste. Um, so this one is a more advanced calcific deposition which is being um, manipulated out with the probe uh, which you can see on the arthroscope here and it, it, it really just oozes out like toothpaste from a, from, a, from a chew and they brush it away and they continue For those patients that fail to respond to op uh, non-operative management and undergo arthroscopic uh, procedure to debride this this lesion, um, the, there's good evidence for it in the removal of the calcium depositions associated with functional improvement, and that was shown in 48 people who underwent arthroscopy. And when compared with debridement of the lesion alone, or also a subacromial decompression, uh, there's no further benefit from a subacromial decompression. So that's really my overview of the topic. Admittedly, a, a very brief talk, but to conclude, um, the main thing to take away is that calcific deposition is, is separate to dystro dystrophic calcification. Um, the vast majority of patients will get away with non-operative treatment, and the good evidence exists for shockwave therapy, and that for those that don't respond to non-operative measures, arthroscopic measures are also uh, a, proven, a proven benefit. These are the references that I used. Thank you very much, Matt.